this third day, we'll also have you asking for more. For today, we have Shiva Chachi with delectable fare to feast your souls. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You all know that this is the third day of the Amrita Shegal National Art Week, which we started on the 18th of this month, uh, commemorating her birth centenary year, and also uh, paying tribute to her. We have dedicated this festival to Amrita Shergill. And I have known uh, Sheba for the last almost uh, 20 years or so. I was introduced to her by a friend in Delhi, a photographer who doesn't live in India anymore. And I had gone to her attic. Then I met her almost 20 years later, few months back at Ranbir Kaleka's home. I couldn't recognize her. Of course, she has grown in stature in terms of our understanding of art, in terms of what she's attained, what she has given to the you know, adoring uh, people all over the world in terms of her installations, video installations and art. First time I saw her art in the uh, photographer's gallery in London. Wonderful work and she still continues to do that. Thank you, Sheba. And we are looking forward to seeing your pr uh, presentation today. Ethiopia born, Delhi University and NIDM, the Bath educated and Delhi based Shiva Chachi's name is synonymous with experimentation and innovativeness. Her site specific public art and independent works employ pre cinematic devices and multi layered illuminated mobile palimpsests that create a new idiom through which she contemplates the personal and the political. She brings together photography, found and sculpted objects, text, film and sound. Her unique blends of ancient iconography, myth, visual traditions, still and moving images resonate with issues of gender, ecology, violence, personal and collective memory. Through her work, she retrieves and chronicles the marginal worlds of women, mendicants, and forgotten forms of labor. The evocative titles of some of her solo shows indicate her concerns. In 2000, there was When the Gun is Raised, Dialogue Stops, which dealt with women in Kashmir. Ganga's Daughters in 2004 spoke of women ascetics. Bhogi Rogi in 2010 dealt with consumption and disease, and Winged Pilgrims is a chronicle from Asia that has evolved from 2007 onwards. This year, her photo video installation, Record Oblique Resist and The Water Diviner have been exhibited at the Kiran Nadar Museum. She has also held exhibitions and participated in prestigious group shows in the US, Germany, Singapore, Paris, Berlin, <coughs> Cuba, Finland, Indonesia, Brazil and New Zealand. Welcome you back. Uh, thank you. I'm going to actually pose some provocations today through sharing some of my practice. The title of my talk is The Politics of Contemplation. We normally think of contemplation as something that is actually removed from the hustle and bustle of daily life. It's withdrawn, it's a space away. Uh, it is definitely disengaged from what we consider the political, which is to do with daily life, to do with the stresses and strains of citizenship, of inhabiting an emerging economy, a troubled democracy. Uh, contemplative is also a space where the subject of contemplation is considered to be something removed from ordinary life, the, the soul, the spirit, uh, higher aspects of the mind. These are all the associations we normally make with the contemplative state. We think of contemplatives as monks or nuns or people who have, in a sense, withdrawn from ordinary life. Politics, on the other hand, as we all know and experience and live, uh, whether in our own lives or whether through the inundation of the mass media, the television, the newspaper, etc., is something that is heated, constantly changing, riven uh, with contestations, a complex, charged, and uncomfortable space. 
So what do I mean when I say the politics of contemplation? I do believe that one of the things that we experience in the current economic, cultural, socio-political regime is a major shift in the way that we experience time. Space is already, uh, whether you think of space as land, property, or simply as space, whether public space or privately owned space, is already almost completely territorialized. It is owned, it is securitized. The uh, shift from vast shared space to increasingly fragmented private ownership or state ownership or corporate ownership of state is something that we have watched in our cities and in our times. Time is in the process of becoming territorialized and securitized and in that sense administered in very special ways. Uh, whether it is the advent of new communication technologies, whether it is the kinds of ways in which we receive information today, our sense of temporality is being rapidly altered. I believe that art offers a possibility to create another kind of temporality. So for me, art interventions actually offer the potential to create a site, a site of contemplation, one in which another kind of temporality is evoked, is uh, inhabited, thereby offering a resistance to one aspect of the kind of political changes we're taking today, uh, we're facing today. This is just one thread in the series of arguments that underlie this work I do. Uh, a lot of my early work was more um, what would be conventionally understood as political. It was documentary photography. I was very engaged in the women's movement. And a lot of the work was, in a sense, issue-based work. I moved from that into creating photo-based installation works. And what I'm going to share with you is four or maybe five such works to think through with you this question of the politics of creating sites of contemplation in the kind of temporal, spatial, cultural moment that we inhabit today. So I take you first to a work called Nilkant, Poison Nectar. It's a work that looks at the apparent binary between poison and nectar based on a story that we're all familiar with, uh, which is the churning of uh, the Samundar to extract Amrit, which then turns into poison, which Shiva swallows, rescuing the world from annihilation. I displace this myth onto the Indian urban situation. The work emerged in a period when I was absolutely horrified by the kind of hyper-urbanization, the production of toxicity, and the manner in which that perhaps all of us were being turned into unwitting nilkants, where we were swallowing the poison, but perhaps we needed to think about modes of transformation, modes of containment. So these are the key questions that the installation seeks to evoke and uh, provoke in the viewer. As you enter the space, it's a very large, uh, I will have to describe it, and it's always very dissatisfying to show images of works that you need to actually physically be in, because these are immersive spaces. These are sites that you must be actually be there. So we're doing with a uh, 50% uh, rendition of the work. Uh, you are looking down at it's a large space, about 25 square feet, and you're looking down at a series, 260 tiny aluminum towers, each of them turned into a miniature light box, uh, arranged in four sections. The form uh, refers to Mandala Yantra formations, which are basically forms of concentration, which draw you towards the center. Uh, in the four corners, like the four gates of a mandala, are four trance lights. We'll go closer to the uh, elements of the installation. Each of the aluminum towers carries an image of one of the five senses. Uh, the five senses which are 
associated with the five elements, earth, water, air, fire, one has a sense, in fact, of um, fragmentation and yet reharmonizing in broader patterns. The entire installation plays with um, conventional boundaries. Um, <coughs> fragmentation, harmony, city, mandala, body, city. Uh, what is beautiful, what is grotesque. These are images drawn from the landfill biggest garbage dumps of Delhi, where garbage is turning into land. They're treated in the manner of colonial landscape. And these are what you see in the four corners. As you come into the center, what you see is the video. Uh, you don't actually see it like this. You s you're looking down on it, and it actually is more ambiguous when you're looking down on it. I'll let you watch it for a bit. The video uses a combination of painting and projection on the body itself. What is immediately recognizable as a throat here is not so recognizable when you're looking down at it from a um, top view. Uh, what you are essentially aware of is a very small, very concentrated visceral movement where that sense of struggle of the struggle to ingest, to contain, um, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, but the endless cycle of this struggle, uh, which persists, changes, etc. I won't show you the whole video, it's quite long, but just give you a sense of it. At a certain moment, the throat is revealed to be as human as it is mythic. And one of the things that I seek to do in my practice increasingly is to look at how the mythic and the social can conjoin to open up new forms of perception, new forms of reflection on our current condition. So Nilkant plays with what we normally see as oppositions, what is grotesque, what is beautiful, what is poison, what is nectar, what is fragmented, what is harmonious, what is the body, what is the city, and brings these tensions, these binaries, um, into a position where the viewer is perhaps prompted into rethinking the seal between these binaries. As we know that in producing, trying to produce nectar, we produce poison, and perhaps now that we have a condition of poison, we can find ways of producing nectar as they really are one, each being a part of the other. I take you now to another work uh, which was mentioned uh, in the introduction. This is a work which um, developed over many years of engagement uh, with Kashmir, with the valley. Uh, where I was part of a women's group that first went in 1995, troubled by the fact that there was no representation at all of women in the entire discourse on Kashmir. Uh, the discourse on Kashmir was dominated by sets of men with guns, whether they were patriots uh, battling for the nation or whether they were militants um, seeking their own autonomy and um, secession from the country. Uh, the whole debate was, again, completely polarized. Hindu, Muslim, India, Pakistan, uh, militant, soldier, etc. One had absolutely no sense of what women felt, how they perceived the situation, and how they survived in the situation. So what you find here as you enter is an extremely long, it's about 50 feet long, um, bed of earth on either side of which uh, brick platforms. Each platform uh, has a small bed of rice and carries a wooden rihal. Rihals are um, the wooden stands used for all our holy books from the Quran to the Guru Granth Sahib to the Gita and the Bible. Somewhat subversively, what we inserted into the uh, wooden book stand were rusted iron sheets which form a kind of book 
like a detritus of war, each carrying a photograph and a testimony. As you walk around uh, the two sides of the installation, two things happen. One is that people who normally encountering image and text, which is the most conventional form of communication and representation that you can find, would move fairly fast and probably not read the text, immediately slow down. And because you had to make an effort and bend down to the platform to actually read what was written there and engage more intimately with the image, just as one does with a book, uh, a kind of procession started forming as viewers went around the work. As they encounter the 36 books that are placed there, what they encounter is a breaking up of these simple categories. Muslim itself is not a single category. They are Shias, they are Sunnis, they are Bakaral, they are Gujars. There are a number of different subject positions simply within the phrase a Kashmiri Muslim within the valley. There are a number of different relationships in to the militancy itself. There are women who have been sexually violated by militants. There are women who have been sexually violated by the army. Uh, there are women who have fought back. There are women who have succumbed. There are mothers, sisters. Uh, a number of women who have found ways of living through this crisis and for them somewhere, and this is a statement that is disturbing to everybody, uh, the difference between one man with a gun and another man with a gun is not that great. And so what emerges as you move through this is one, a breaking up of the very fixed polarized discourse in Kashmir to create a third space, a space where you humanize the discourse because you are actually listening to ordinary women talking about their lives and their experiences. And you are also profoundly moved by the dignity and courage of these women who in the midst of a 22-year-old undeclared war actually speak of compassion. And this is where I think the seeds of conflict resolution lie. I'll just show you a few of the photographs. The um, texts and photographs are also mixed up, so it's not necessary that the particular image and the particular text go together. Uh, the testimonies are collected over six years of research. And what happened in the showing of this work is interesting. Uh, when we first made this work, it was almost impossible to show it anywhere. Everyone was afraid, it was too hot, it was too political, it was difficult. And we finally got the possibility of showing this as part of the umbrella of a women in conflict um, gathering, women in conflict in South Asia. And while we were setting up the work, this was in the uh, Visual Arts Gallery in the Habitat Center in Delhi, the organizers got very nervous and removed their name and anything referring to who they were from the entire space. We were asked if we would allow um, the installation to be vetted, and we said we would not allow this, and we would stand by our work. This was a period when there were a lot of attacks on artworks, etc. This is 2000. Uh, very interestingly, what happened was an extraordinary response. I think. Chandigarh would also be a place which would have very passionate feelings about Kashmir. It links into also partition histories, shared histories, shared narratives that we have. Uh, people started flooding in. There was a tremendous response in media. And by the next day, uh, we had to open at 10 o'clock in the morning. It was scheduled to open at 2 o'clock, but people were standing outside waiting. We also had more formal discussions with groups of students, uh, as well as uh, a visitor's book in which people wrote uh, very long texts. Many of those texts actually seem to be um, deeply grateful for the fact there was a space to speak about Kashmir in a language that was different. 
the installation itself uses um, two elements, which are one is the Mughal garden in terms of the overall geometry and the haven, the little platform of books, and creates a completely different bodily relationship to what could otherwise have been encountered as not unfamiliar kinds of statements and images, except that these were women that had never been heard before. Uh, so I offer you this as another attempt to create a site of contemplation where perhaps uh, a more direct, complex and difficult political situation is able to open up another kind of discourse. The work is unfortunately still absolutely relevant today. I take you now to another work uh, called Wing Pilgrims, a Chronicle from Asia. I'm not going chronologically because I'm actually trying to present these works as... So one of the entries into this work is through sound, so let it just play. This is a work that um, uses three elements, both material and metaphoric. The figure of the pilgrim, the uh, figure of the bird, and the uh, kitsch street toy called a plasma action TV of Chinese manufacture that I found flooding uh, markets in India. These plasma action toys usually carry kitsch imaginary landscapes where you have Golden Gate Bridge, dolphins, fighter planes, Dubai uh, skyscrapers all collaged together into some kind of utopic vision. A lot of these utopic visions are pastoral and have a kind of fantasy of nature as landscape always had. Uh, this work begins in 2006. 2005 saw this extraordinary panic over bird flu, where, which was called as Asian avian flu, where for the first time in history, a huge number of birds were actually culled, killed, murdered. You can use the most polite form of the term. And the migratory patterns of birds were sought to be controlled. This has clear implications for the panic over Asian migration into the West. The first bird that was killed uh, was a wild swan as it entered Scotland. For me, this provoked a series of thoughts about the hunts, which for us is, uh, embodies the power of discrimination. They say that the hunts can separate milk from water. And it seemed that in murdering this bird, we were also metaphorically murdering that capacity in ourselves. Birds have always stood for uh, the more elevated aspect of the human. And through history, you have stories of birds, legends, parables, folk tales, which actually uh, develop this as um, a kind of companion to human aspiration. So placing the metaphor of the bird on one side, the other is the question of landscape, landscape as a mediator and as a signifier of the kind of relationships that human beings are making with the earth. Bringing this all together into a mapping of Asian cosmopolitanism and um, looking at what globalization means. We have tended to see globalization as the West happening to us, but not really looked at another sideline into earlier forms of cosmopolitanism, of exchange across Asia. So this work tries to work with these several complex layers. It's an installation which uses 11 light boxes and these five sculptures. The the robes evoke the absence of the pilgrim. 
the Lohan was traditionally represented as carrying the first text, uh, the first sutras that went from uh, India to Japan. And here instead, what they're holding is uh, a motion lamp, uh, a kitsch toy from um, the market, which actually, I, uh, two of them are direct quotations from the market of the landscapes that I just described. I don't think I have an image of those. And the others are images that I have created, which speak about uh, bird flu, whether men in contamination suits seem to have some kind of peculiar relationship with the robes of the pilgrim. So these witnesses who form one end of this long history of exchanges. So the pilgrims in the 6th or 7th century, the motion lamp and the plasma action toy now. Uh, this kind of frame, this series of explorations of how birds, stories that using birds as a kind of pin, a web to, to kind of do this historical, quasi-historical tracing, metaphoric tracing, uh, you, each light box draws on multiple landscape traditions from the Chinese uh, classic brush, brush painting of the Song Dynasty, but brings them into juxtaposition um, with, for example, the pre-Sanskrit um, text, which is the oldest extinct form of the sutra, uh, the Garuda, which is from a South Indian sculpture, which moved. The moving light box images are uh, not so pleasurable to see in still images. What you have is a still ground and a moving layer, and uh, one is translucent and one is transparent, and as the moving layer moves across the ground, it makes new relations and fuses with the ground in special ways. So these 11 light boxes map this kind of movement uh, through Central Asia, the movement of music. Uh, here, in fact, this is... Uh, drawn from several miniatures, but it's a completely constructed image. Crows have historically, metaphorically brought, brought bad news. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a shamanistic figure from Indonesia. I'm just giving you, I'm just flagging some of the many, many layers uh, that go in to constitute these newly imagined landscapes uh, to speak about a rich history of exchange. Uh, coming up to, I'm, I'm, I don't have all of them here because that would take far too long. Coming up to a documentary image, the devastated Yamuna in the city of Delhi, uh, colonial ships and the Kaha bird. Each of these birds actually also embodies a story and a story that you find repeating itself. So the same story will appear in Persia, somewhere in India, perhaps in Thailand, and then again in Japan, which is actually an extraordinary, um, it's just amazing. It was, as I was discovering this, it was unbelievably rich. So I'll tell you very briefly the story of the Kaha bird, because it becomes a central allegory for what the kinds of questions that Wing Pilgrims is trying to raise. Um, the Kaha bird, there was a poor fisherman this will sound very familiar to all of you, who was not able to even catch enough fish to feed his family. So he was sitting disconsolate, sad by the river bank, and this beautiful blue bird came and sat next to him and said, why are you so sad? And he said, I can't even feed my family tonight. And she said, your basket will always be full. And so it was, and it was so full that he could even sell the fish. And he prospered, and she would come and give him boons and blessings. And he became quite a wealthy man and had a wonderful house and was doing very well. The king heard that this magical bird came and offered uh, all these boons to this poor fisherman and announced a prize, an enormous prize, for the capture of this bird because the king wanted the bird. The fisherman was tempted and uh, colluded with the uh, king's <laughs> soldiers and laid a trap. So the next time the car bird came to him, uh, he said, you have never come and eaten at my house in all these years, so I'd like to invite you. So she agrees. And as she's flying down towards his house, she notices the soldiers hiding in the bushes. 
and they try to leap out to catch her and she stops before she reaches the ground and is absolutely appalled and horrified and starts to go back up and he is so desperate that he actually holds on to her claws and she rises up with the fisherman dangling from her talons uh, appalled at the greed and ingratitude of human beings and swearing that she'd have nothing to do with this species again. Uh, it's a story about greed, it's a story about how we lose what we most treasure through greed, which I think is a fitting allegory for what we have done to our environment and to our relationship with the natural world, with the non-human world. These details give you a sense of how the layering works. So you get uh, each time the moving layer, like uh, for instance the crows, would move across the landscape, you would see another part revealed and another part actually mixing and meeting with the crows. Uh, I won't go into details of the other light boxes, but you come towards the end of this enclosed space. You are in a space where, um, which is immersive. The, a lot of the immersion is created by the soundtrack that you briefly heard. The track itself was specially composed for this and is based on note structures across the region uh, by Vidya Rao and sung by her a cappella. There are no instruments, so it works with patterning and uh, ideas of flight built into note structures across Asia. So you come to these two um, large light boxes which collapse some of the key themes of Wing Pilgrims into uh, one light box. This is uh, what this should lo look like rather than this. Uh, this is the flex translation and it's much larger. The actual piece is about 60 inches by about 34 inches. One thing that happens with the moving image light boxes which particularly interests me and brings me back to the question of constellating different forms of temporality is that most people, when they look at it, think that this is a video. When they come close to it, they realize that it's possibly not a video, but yet there's a moving image. So just that curiosity actually makes people slow down and wait to see what will happen. And even though it is a loop that repeats itself, in the repetition and every repetition there is some element of change. So the something that is neither a still image nor a moving image in terms of conventional video time uh, creates another kind of time, an in-between time, which immediately slows people down and elicits a quality of attention which is quite different and opens up a space uh, for minds and eyes and senses that are inundated and saturated with both the moving and the still image. I continue to work with this object, developing it further and further from that first adaptation from the street toy, but I'm not going to go into other iterations of that, but to take you into another work. So what I'm doing in Nilkant in uh, Winged Pilgrims is recuperating ancient iconography, myths, fables, to calibrate an inquiry into the present. So it is uh, a, a relationship to heritage, thinking about what Kavita has been saying about uh, the uses of the past to the present. For me, I find that we have what I would think of as a kind of eco-philosophy embedded in a lot of our practices and in a lot of our stories. They've gotten evacuated of their content. They've either become me mechanized ritual or they have become mere parroting of things without actually understanding the ideas that underlie them. And I believe that this is a condition that impoverishes the ecological discourse. So a lot of my work in the recent period is about trying to recuperate this eco-philosophy in ways that can make sense to us as people concerned with the current crisis. I take you to another work called The Water Diviner. This was originally a site-specific work in the Delhi Public Library as part of a huge public art project. Uh, as you enter the space, it's uh, 
The site is quite an extraordinary one, so let me describe it a little bit. The, and I found it by pure serendipity. I was passing the Delhi Public Library. It's the busy, crazy, choked with traffic road of the old Delhi railway station. And I suddenly noticed a little plaque saying, swimming pool. And I said, swimming pool in the Delhi Public Library? What is this? I went in and investigated and found, they said, ha, ha, kuch hai. There was a small door, tiny door, about five feet. And it had been roughly kind of uh, nail shut, but the nails were loose, so I pushed it open and stepped in. And what I saw there was extraordinary. This was an ex-colonial swimming pool, about 70 feet long, with a colonial fountain on one side, piled high with rubbish, with debris, all the refuse of the library. And the library is the central library, which has more than 200 branches, including mobile vans that cover the entire district. Uh, abandoned books, broken fans, um, cushions with the stuffing pouring out of it, old newspapers, etc. So this space actually was quite extraordinary because it sat on a site of one of the oldest waterways in the city of Delhi. So when you enter this space, you enter a saturated blue light, you yourself become blue, and you navigate a fairly narrow path through these mountains of books. You can see on the top where you enter is the colonial fountain. This had been dead for about 60 years, and I actually got it running again. So the sound of falling water permeates the space. As you come down through this path, running down the central aisle, at various points they had tried to make it into a meeting hall, so they built these steps and these kind of tired platforms. You find a gutter. The gutter is a light box, which carries a map from 1832 of Shah Janabad, showing the waterways of the streets that you have just walked off. So you realize that Chandni Chowk was actually a water canal. And clearly marked here is the complex web of water systems, of drains and canals, and its relationship to the Yamuna, which is not far from the site. Alongside, as you move amongst these cascades, um, these cliffs of books which seem to teeter and cascade, you find placed in between these piles of books uh, small light boxes in the shape of books, which I call the illuminated books, and I beg forgiveness from uh, the original use of the term. Uh, these are books that draw upon images which represented ways of living along the river, riverine culture. A lot of them are drawn from around the Krishna stories and the miniatures around the Krishna stories. This is a Jain ascetic, a classic trope of um, the river. And all of these images are actually tropes which are reenacted in popular cinema, whether it is the beauties bathing in the river, whether it is the lovers on the river bank, whether it is women at the well, or um, etc., or the ascetic or the musician. But I bring these miniatures, and um, this is transgressive, into relationship with what the river is today and what the water is today. So you see the same gopis and the same landscape, but the water is the water of the Yamuna today. Or you see Radha and Krishna uh, on the river bank, but there's a new kind of lotus, which is gutka uh, packets, um, etc. Uh, these two have stories. And as you wander through the entire space and spend time in the installation, and you have to actually go on the side and look at these, uh, you are invited to remember, and literally by that I mean bringing limbs that have been separated together again, remembered. Because uh, these stories are extant. Most people do remember these stories or some version of these stories. And they embody different ways of understanding uh, 
stories about the river and the ecological condition of the river. So I'll tell you one story. So the last image you see is Balram. Yamuna, as you know, is a goddess as well as a river. And she's the lover of Krishna, but Balram also desires her. Now Krishna is a cowherd and Balram is a farmer. This distinction is really important. So one day, the story goes, Balram has been drinking and wants to cool off in the waters of the river. And he's in a forest grove with some companions and he yells out to the river and says, come and cool me off. And she's offended and says, if you need to bathe in my rivers, you come to the river bank and bathe. And he puts out his plow, he's always shown with his hull, and begins to drag the river towards him. The image is of dragging a woman by her hair. And she begins to split into tiny tributaries, tiny, tiny, tiny streams. Realizing, and there's, there's a long dialogue between the two of them, uh, where he insists, and she finally realizes that her capacity to nurture would be destroyed if she's turned into many tiny streams. And so she acquiesces and floods the forest grove in which he's sitting. What I place below that is the first dam on the Yamuna as she leaves the mountains at Dakbatar to come down to the plains. So perhaps this tale is a tale of the first dam in mythology or in mythological history. Uh, all of these images create these juxtapositions to bring us into a sense of the past as not nostalgic, not lost, not another era which has only um, uh, a sense of we were like that as uh, significant, but significant to us right now in terms of the way we understand what is happening to our environment. The work is titled The Water Diviner because it invites every participant to be like a water diviner, to use the artwork as a divining rod, as an instrument to read, to trace the subterranean stories, geographies, and traces of water that lie beneath the choked and crowded streets of traffic. So you go from the colonial, evoked by the fountain, uh, black water comes out of the mouth of the line, you come down encountering these various extracts from the pre-colonial, the Mughal, uh, and you move towards a space which is the gutter evokes again Shahjanabad in the Mughal period, and you move towards a large video projection at the end which could be called pre-modern or could be called uh, outside this kind of linear historiography. I wish to leave you with this image of the dissolving, reconstituting, dissolving, reconstituting elephant as a metaphor for cultural memory and also for an art practice which seeks to move away from the creation of objects or images or image statements to one of creating immersive experiences, experiences which offer the possibility to reconnect with multiple layers, both of personal, social and cultural memory. Thank you. Mum is the word. S such a powerful silencing presentation. <laughs> I must confess I haven't seen a better presentation by any artist uh, in my you know, pr practice of almost 30 years or so. That's high praise and I don't think it's warranted. <laughs> uh, actually, see, I'm a photographer and I do use camera. As many pictures I was clicking, as many shutter sounds, I was feeling I'm the culprit. I am actually, you know, I'm feeling embarrassed myself as many pictures I was clicking. But because we needed, even some people were coughing. It is beyond control sometimes. Sometimes we don't really try to control, but I was wishing that I don't click and nobody laughs, nobody coughs. And it has really silences an artist's role in society so personified in such a beautiful manner, such a sensitive, silent manner. There's no other word, probably Prasa Goswami at the end of the 
evening would share his thoughts in a better way with us. Thank you.